Hello everyone, Pastor Dan here again with the final two chapters of The Horse and His Boy. I hope you have enjoyed hearing these classic stories by C.S. Lewis. There are several more books, and though I won't be reading them aloud, I will provide a link for you in uh, the Facebook um, post and also in the description of this video uh, for you to download these books from Project Bo Gutenberg Canada, uh, and you can read them on your own. Uh, for the rest, uh, or you can have a parent read them to you, or a friend, or something like that. Uh, so uh, enjoy them. They are all very good. Now, we are going to read chapter 14, How Bree Became a Wiser Horse. And if you remember, we left off with the battle against the Calarmines having been won, and with Shasta meeting King Loon again, and King Loon having said something about how similar he looked to Prince Corin, and everyone applauding and uh, him not understanding what, go what was going on. So, chapter 14. We must now return to Erebus and the horses. The hermit, watching his pool, was able to tell them that Shasta was not killed or even seriously wounded, for he saw him get up and how affectionately he was greeted by King Loon. But as he could only see, not hear, he did not know what anyone was saying, and once the fighting had stopped and the talking had begun, it was not worth while looking in the pool any longer. Next morning, while the hermit was indoors, the three of them discussed what they should do next. "'I've had enough of this,' said Quinn. "'The hermit has been very good to us, and I'm very much obliged to him, I'm sure. But I'm getting as fat as a pet pony eating all day and getting no exercise. Let's go on to Narnia.' "'Oh, not today, ma'am,' said Bree. "'I wouldn't hurry things. Some other day, don't you think?' We must see Shasta first, and say goodbye to him, and apologize, said Erebus. Exactly, said Bree, with great enthusiasm. Just what I was going to say. Oh, oh of course, said Wynn. I expect he is in Anvard. Naturally, we'd look in on him and say goodbye, but that's on our way. And why shouldn't we start at once? After all, I thought it was Narnia we all wanted to get to. I suppose so, said Erebus. She was beginning to wonder what exactly she would do when she got there and was feeling a little lonely. Of course, of course, said Bree hastily. There's no need to rush things, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean, said Wynne. Why don't you want to go? <laughs> muttered Bree. Well, don't you see, ma'am, it's an important occasion, returning to one's country, entering society, the best society. It is so essential to make a good impression, not perhaps looking quite ourselves yet, eh? <coughs> Quinn broke out into a hoarse laugh. It's your tail, Bree. I see it all now. You want to wait till your tail's grown again, and we don't even know if tails are worn long in Narnia. Really? Bree, you're as vain as that Tarkina and Tashban. You are silly, Bree, said Erebus. By the lion's mane, Tarkina, it's nothing of the sort, said Bree indignantly. I have a proper respect for myself and my fellow horses, that's all. Bree, said Erebus, who is not very interested in the cut of his tail, I've been wanting to ask you something for a long time. Why do you keep on swearing by the lion, and by the lion's mane. I thought you hated lions. So I do, answered Bree. But when I speak of the lion, of course I mean Aslan, the great deliverer of Narnia, who drove away the witch in the winter. All Narnians swear by him. But is he a lion? No, no, of course not, said Bree in a rather shocked voice. All the stories about him in Tashban say he is, replied Erebus. And if he isn't a lion, why do you call him a lion? Well, you'd hardly understand at your age, said Bree. And I was only a little foal when I left, so I don't quite fully understand myself. 
Bree was standing with his back to the green wall while he said this, and the other two were facing him. He was talking in rather a superior tone, when, with his eyes half shut. That was why he didn't see the changed expression on the faces of Quinn and Aramis. They had good reason to have open mouths and staring eyes, because while Bree spoke, they saw an enormous lion leap up from outside and balance itself on the top of the green wall. Only it was a brighter yellow, and it was bigger and more beautiful and more alarming than any they had ever seen. And at once it jumped down inside the wall and began approaching Bree from behind. It made no noise at all, and Wynne and Aramis couldn't make any noise themselves, no more than if they were frozen. No doubt, continued Bree, when they speak of him as a lion, they only mean he's as strong as a lion, or, to our enemies, of course, as fierce as a lion, or something of that kind. Even a little girl like you, Aramis, must see that it would be quite absurd to suppose he is a real lion. Indeed, it would be disrespectful. If he was a lion, he'd have to be a beast, just like the rest of us. Why, and here Bree began to laugh, if he was a lion, he'd have four paws and a tail, and whiskers. Oh, help! For, just as he said the word whiskers, one of Aslan's had actually tickled his ear. Bree shot away like an arrow to the other side of the enclosure, and there turned. The wall was too high for him to jump, and he could fly no further. Erebus and Huynh both started back. There was about a second of intense silence. Then Huynh, though shaking all over, gave a strange little neigh and trotted across to the lion. Please, she said, you're so beautiful. You may eat me if you like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. Dearest daughter, said Aslan, planting a lion's kiss on her twitching velvet nose, I knew you would not be long in coming to me. Joy shall be yours. Then he lifted his head and spoke in a louder voice. Now, Bree, he said, you poor, proud, frightened horse, draw near. Nearer still, my son. Do not dare not to dare. Touch me. Smell me. Here are my paws. Here is my tail. These are my whiskers. I am a true beast. Aslan, said Bree in a shaken voice. I'm afraid I must be rather a fool. Happy the horse who knows that while he is still young, or the human either. Draw near, Aravis, my daughter. See, my paws are velveted. You will not be torn this time. This time, sire? said Aravis. It was I who wounded you, said Aravis. I am the only lion you met in all your journeying. Do you know why I tore you? No, sir. The scratches on your back, tear for tear, throb for throb, blood for blood, were equal to the stripes laid on the back of your stepmother's slave because of the drugged sleep you cast on her. You needed to know what it felt like. Yes, sir. Please. Ask on, my dear, said Aslan. Will any more harm come to her by what I did? Child, said the lion, I am telling you your story, not hers. No one is told any story but their own. Then he shook his head and spoke in a lighter voice. Be merry, little ones, he said. We shall meet again soon, but before that you will have another visitor. Then in one bound he reached the top of the wall and vanished from their sight, Strange to say, they felt no inclination to talk to one another about him after he had gone. They all moved slowly away to different parts of the quiet grass, and there paced to and fro, each alone, thinking. 
About half an hour later, the two horses were summoned to the back of the house to eat something nice that the hermit had got ready for them, and Erebus, still walking and thinking, was startled by the harsh sound of a trumpet outside the gate. "'Who's there?' asked Erebus. "'His Royal Highness, Prince Kor of Arkenland,' said a voice from outside. Erebus undid the door and opened it, drawing back a little way to let the strangers in. Two soldiers with halberds came first and took their stand at each side of the entry, then followed a herald and the trumpeter. His Royal Highness Prince Kor of Arkenland desires an audience of the Lady Erevis, said the herald. Then he and the trumpeter drew aside and bowed and the soldiers saluted and the prince himself came in. All his attendants withdrew and closed the gate behind him. The prince bowed and... A very clumsy bow for a prince it was. Erevis curtsied in the Calamine style, which is not at all like ours, and did it very well, because, of course, she had been taught how. Then she looked up and saw what sort of person the prince was. She saw a mere boy. He was bareheaded, and his fair hair was encircled with a very thin band of gold, hardly thicker than a wire. His upper tunic was of white cambric as fine as a handkerchief, so that the bright red tunic beneath it showed through. His left hand, which rested on his enameled sword hilt, was bandaged. Erevis looked quite twice at his face before she gasped and said, Why, it's Shasta! Shasta all at once turned very red and began speaking very quickly. Look here, Erevis, he said. I do hope you won't think I'm got up like this and the trumpeter and all to try to impress you or make out that I'm different or any rot of that sort, because I'd far rather have come in my old clothes, but they're burnt now, and my father said, Your father? said Erebus. Well, apparently King Loon is my father, said Shasta. I might really have guessed it, Corin being so like me. We were twins, you see. Oh, and my name isn't Shasta, it's Cor. Kor is a nicer name than Shasta, said Erebus. Brothers' names run like that in Ar Arkenland, said Shasta, or Prince Kor, as we must call him now, like Dar and Darren, or Cole and Colin, and so on. Shasta, I, I mean Kor, said Erebus. No, shut up. There's something I've got to say at once. I'm sorry I've been such a pig, but I did change before I knew you were a prince. Honestly, I did, when you went back and faced the lion. It wasn't really going to kill you at all, that lion, said Kor. I know, said Erebus, nodding. Both were still and solemn for a moment, as each saw that the other knew about Aslan. Suddenly, Erebus remembered Kor's bandaged hand. I say, she cried, I forgot, you've been in the battle. Is that a wound? A mere scratch, said Kor, using for the first time a rather lordly tone. But a moment later he burst out laughing and said, If you want to know the truth, it isn't a proper wound at all. I only took the skin off my knuckles just as any clumsy fool might do without going near a battle. Still, you were in the battle, said Erebus. It must have been wonderful. It wasn't at all like what I thought, said Kor. But Sha Kor, I mean, you haven't told me anything yet about King Loon and how he found out who you were. Well... Let's sit down, said Kor, for it's rather a long story. And by the way, father's an absolute brick. I'd be just as pleased, or very nearly, at finding he was my father even if he weren't a king, even though education and all sorts of horrible things are going to happen to me. But you want the story. Well, Corin and I are twins, and about a week after we were both born, apparently, they took us to a wise old centaur in Narnia to be blessed or something. Now this centaur was a prophet, as good as a good many centaurs are. Perhaps you haven't seen any centaurs yet? There were some in the battle yesterday, most remarkable people, but I can't say I feel quite at home with them yet. I say, Erebus, there are going to be a lot of things to get used to in these northern countries. Yes, there are, said Erebus. But get on with the story. Well, as soon as he saw Corin and me, it seems this centaur looked at me and said, A day will come when that boy will save Arkenland from the deadliest danger in which ever she lay. So, of course, my father and mother were very pleased. But there was someone present who wasn't. There was this, 
there was a chap called the Lord Barr, who had been Father's Lord Chancellor, and apparently he'd done something wrong. Bezzling, or some word like that. I didn't understand that part very well, and Father had to dismiss him. But nothing else was done to him, and he was allowed to go on living in Arkenland. But he must have been as bad as he could be, for it came out afterwards he had been in the pay of the Tisrock and had been sent a lot of se and had sent a lot of secret information to Tashman. So as soon as he heard I was going to save Arkenland from a great danger, he decided I must be put out of the way. While well, he succeeded in kidnapping me, I don't exactly know how, and rode away down the winding arrow to the coast. He'd ever had everything prepared, and there was a ship manned with his own followers lying ready for him, and he put out to sea with me on board. But father got wind of it, though not quite in time, and was after him as quickly as he could. The Lord Barr was already at sea when father reached the coast, but not out of sight, and father was embarked in one of his own warships within twenty minutes. It must have been a wonderful chase. They were six days following Barr's galleon and brought her to battle on the seventh. It was a great sea fight. I heard a lot about it yesterday evening, from ten o'clock in the morning till sunset. Our people took the ship in the end, but I wasn't there. The Lord Barr himself had been killed in the battle, but one of his men said that earlier that morning, as soon as he saw he was certain to be overhauled, Barr had given me to one of his knights and sent us both away in, a sh in the ship's boat. And that boat was never seen again. But, of course, that was the same boat that Aslan, he seems to be at the back of all these stories, pushed ashore at the right place for Arshish to pick me up. I wish I knew that knight's name, for he must have kept me alive and starved himself to do it. I suppose Aslan would say that was part of someone else's story, said Erebus. I was forgetting that, said Cor. And I wonder how the prophecy will work out, said Erebus, and what the greater the great danger is that you're to save Arkenland from. Well, said Cor rather awkwardly, they seem to think I've done it already. Erebus clapped her hands. Why, of course, she said. How stupid I am, and how wonderful. Arkenland can never be in much great greater danger than it was when Rabidash had crossed the arrow with his two hundred horse and you hadn't yet got through your th with your message. Don't you feel proud? I think I feel a little bit scared, said Cor. And you'll be living at Anvard now, said Erebus rather wistfully. Oh, said Cor, I nearly forgot what I came about. Father wants you to come and live with us. He says there's been no lady in the court. They call it the court, I don't know why. Since mother died. Do, Erebus. You'll be like, you'll like father and Corin. They're not like me. They've been properly brought up. You needn't be afraid that... Oh, stop it, said Erebus. Or we'll have a real fight. Of course I'll come. Now, let's go and see the horses, said Cor. There was a great and joyous meeting between Bree and Cor, and Bree, who was still in a rather subdued frame of mind, agreed to set out for Anvard at once. He and Hwyn would cross into Narnia on the following day. All four bade an affectionate farewell to the hermit and promised that they would visit him again soon. By about the middle of the morning they were on their way. The horses had expected that Erebus and Cor would ride, but... Cor explained that, except in war, where everyone must do what he can do best, no one in our Narnia or Arkenland ever dreamed of mounting a talking horse. This reminded poor Bree again of how little he knew about Narnian customs and what dreadful mistakes he might make. So while Huynh strolled along in a happy dream, Bree got more nervous and more self-conscious with every step he took. "'Buck up, Bree,' said Cor. It's far worse for me than for you. You aren't going to be educated. I shall be learning reading and writing and heraldry and dancing and history and music, while you'll be galloping and rolling on the hills of Narnia to your heart's content. But that's just the point, groaned Bree. Do talking horses roll? Supposing they don't, I can't bear to give it up. What do you think, Quinn? I'm going to roll anyway said Hwyn. I don't suppose any of them will care two lumps of sugar whether you roll or not. Are we near the castle? said Bree to Cor. Round the next bend, said the prince. Well, said Bree, I'm going to have a good one now. It may be the last. Wait for me a minute. 
It was five minutes before he rose again, blowing hard and covered with bits of bracken. Now I'm ready, he said in a voice of profound gloom. Lead on, Prince Cor, Narnia in the north. But he looked more like a horse going to a funeral than a long-lost captive returning to home and freedom. Chapter 15, Rabidash the Ridiculous The next turn of the, of the road brought them out from among the trees, and there, across green lawns, sheltered from the north wind by the high wooded ridge at its back, they saw the castle of Anvard. It was very old, and built of a warm, reddish-brown stone. Before they had reached the gate, King Loon came out to meet them, not looking at all like Erevis's idea of a king, and wearing the oldest of old clothes, for he had just come from making a round of the kennels with his huntsman, and had only stopped for a moment to wash his doggy hands. But the bow which, which he, the bow with which he greeted Erevis he, as he took her hand would have been stately enough for an emperor. "'Little lady,' he said, "'we bid you heartily welcome. "'If my dear wife was still alive, "'we could make you better cheer, "'but could not do it with a better will. "'And I am sorry that you have had misfortunes "'and been driven from your father's house, "'which cannot be but a grief to you. "'My son Cor has told me about your adventures together "'and all your valour. "'It was he who did all that, sir,' said Erebus. "'Why, he rushed at a lion to save me.' "'Eh? What's that?' said King Loon, his face brightening. "'I haven't heard that part of the story.' Then Erevis told it, and Kor, who had very much wanted this story to be known, though he felt he, he couldn't tell it himself, didn't enjoy it near so much as he had expected, and indeed felt rather foolish. But his father enjoyed it very much indeed, and in the course of the next few weeks told it to so many people that Kor wished it had never happened. Then the king turned to Huynh and Bree, and was just as polite to them as to Erebus, and asked them a lot of questions about their families and where they had lived in Narnia before they had been captured. The horses were rather tongue-tied, for they weren't yet used to being talked to as equals by humans, grown-up humans, that is. They didn't mind Erebus and Kor. Presently Queen Lucy came out of the castle and joined them, and King Loon said to Erebus, My dear, here is a loving friend of our house, and she has been seeing that your departments are put rights for you better than I could have done it. You'd like to come and see them, wouldn't you? said Lucy, kissing Erebus. They liked each other at once, and soon went away together to talk about Erebus's bedroom, and Erebus's boudoir, and about getting clothes for her, and all the sorts of things girls do talk about on such an occasion. After lunch, which they had on the terrace, it was cold birds and game pie, and wine and bread and cheese, King Loon ruffled up his brow and heaved a sigh, and said, "'Hi ho, we have still that sorry creature Rabidash on our hands, my friends,' and must needs resolve what to do with him. Lucy was sitting on the king's right, and Erevis on his left. King Edmund sat at the one end of the table, and the Lord Darren faced him at the other. Dar and Peridon and Cor and Corin were on the same side as the king. "'Your Majesty would have a perfect right to strike off his head,' said Peridon. "'Such an assault as he has made put a, puts him on a level with assassins.' It is very true, said Edmund, but even a traitor may mend. I have known one that did, and he looked very thoughtful. To kill this rabidash would go near to raising war with the Tisrock, said Darren. A fig for the Tisrock, said King Loon. His strength is in numbers, and numbers will never cross the desert. But I have no stomach for killing men, even traitors, in cold blood. To have cut his throat in the battle would have eased my heart mightily. But this is a different thing. By my counsel, said Lucy, your majesty shall give him another trial. Let him go free on straight promise of fair dealing in the future. It may be that he will keep his word. Maybe apes will grow honest, sister, said Edmund. But by the line, if he breaks it again, may it be in such time and place that any of us could swap off his head in clean battle? It shall be tried said the king, and then to one of his attendants, send for the prisoner, friend. Rabidash was brought before them in chains.
To look at him, anyone would have supposed that he had passed the night in a noisome dungeon without food or water, but in reality he had been shut up in quite a comfortable room and provided with an excellent supper. But as he was sulking far too furiously to touch the supper and had spent the whole night stamping and roaring and cursing, he naturally did not now look his best. "'Your Royal Highness needs not to be told,' said King Loon, "'that by the law of nations, as well as by all reasons of prudent policy, "'we have as good a right to your head as ever one mortal man had against another. "'Nevertheless, in consideration of your youth and the ill-nurture, "'devoid of all gentilese and courtesy, "'which you have doubtless had in the land of slaves and tyrants, "'we are disposed to set you free, unharmed, on these conditions. First, that... "'Curse you for a barbarian dog!' spluttered Rabidash. "'Do you think I will even hear your conditions? "'Fah! You talk very largely of nurture, and I know not what. "'It's easy to a man in chains. "'Ha! Take off these vile bonds. "'Give me a sword, and let any of you who dares then debate with me.' "'Nearly all of the lords sprang to their feet, "'and Corrin shouted, "'Father, can I box him, please?' Peace, your majesties, my lords, said King Loon. Have we no more gravity among us than to be so chafed by the ta taunt of a page -ock? Sit down, Corin, or shalt leave the table. I ask your highness again to hear our conditions. I hear no conditions from barbarians and sorcerers, said Rabidash. Not one of you dare touch a hair of my head. Every insult you have heaped on me shall be paid with oceans of Narnian and Arkanlandish blood. Terrible shall be the vengeance of the Tisrock, even now. But kill me, and the burnings and torturings in these northern lands shall become a tale to frighten the world a thousand years hence. Beware! Beware! The bolt of Tash falls from above! Does it ever get caught on a hook halfway? asked Corin. Shame, Corin, said the king. Never taunt a man save when he is stronger than you. Then, as you please. Oh, you foolish rabidash, sighed Lucy. Next moment, Cor wondered why everyone at the table had risen and was standing perfectly still. Of course, he did the same himself, and then he saw the reason. Aslan was among them, though no one had seen him coming. Rabidash started as the immense shape of the lion paced softly in between him and his accusers. Rabidash, said Aslan, take heed. Your doom is very near, but you may still avoid it. Forget your pride, what have you to be proud of? And your anger, who has done you wrong? And accept the mercy of these good kings. Then Rabidash rolled his eyes and spread out his mouth into a horrible, long, mirthless grin like a shark, and wagged his ears up and down. Anyone can learn how to do this if they take the trouble. He had always found this very effective in Calamon. The bravest had trembled when he made these faces, and ordinary people had fallen to the floor, and the sensitive people had often fainted. But what Rabidash hadn't realized is that it is very easy to frighten people who know you can have them boiled alive the moment you give the word. The grimaces didn't look at all alarming in Arkenland. Indeed, Lucy only thought Rabidash was going to be sick. Demon! 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 shrieked the prince. I know you. You are the foul fiend of Narnia. You are the enemy of the gods. Learn who I am, horrible phantasm. I am descended from Tash, the inexorable, the irresistible. The curse of Tash is upon you. Lightning in the shape of scorpions shall be rained on you. The mountains of Narnia shall be ground into dust. The... Have a care, Rabidash said Aslan quietly. The doom is nearer now. It is at the door. It has lifted the latch. Let the skies fall, said shrieked Rabidash. Let the earth gape. Let blood and fire obliterate the world. But be sure I will never desist till I have dragged to my palace by her hair the barbarian queen, the daughter of dogs, the... The hour has struck, said Aslan. And Rabidash saw, to his supreme horror, that everyone 
had begun to laugh. They couldn't help it. Rabidash had been wagging his ears all the time, and as soon as Aslan said the hour has struck, the ears began to change. They grew longer and more pointed, and, as, and soon were covered with gray hair. And while everyone was wondering where they had seen ears like that before, Rabidash's face began to change too. It grew longer and thicker at the top, and larger eyed, and the nose sank back into the face, or else the face swelled out and became all nose. And there was hair all over it, and his arms grew longer and came down in front of him till his hands were resting on the ground, only they weren't hands now, they were hooves. And he was standing on all fours, and his clothes disappeared, and everyone laughed louder and louder because they couldn't help it. For now what had been Rabidash was simply and unmistakably a donkey. The terrible thing was that this human speech lasted just a moment longer than his human shape, so that when he realized the change that was coming over him, he screamed out, Oh, not a donkey! Mercy! If it were even a horse! Eeyore! 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 And so the words died away into a donkey's bray. Now hear me, Rabidash, said Aslan. Justice shall be mixed with mercy. You shall not always be an ass. At this, of course, the donkey twitched its ears forward, and that also was so funny that everyone laughed all the more. He tried not to, but they tried in vain. You have appealed to Tash, said Aslan, and in the temple of Tash you shall be healed. You must stand before the altar of Tash in Tashban at the great autumn feast this year. And there, in the sight of old Tashban, your ass's shape will fall from you, and all men will know you for Prince Rabidash. But as long as you live, if ever you go more than ten miles away from the great temple in Tashban, you shall instantly become again as you now are. And from that second change, there will be no return. There was a short silence. And then they all stirred and looked at one another as if they were waking from sleep. Aslan was gone, but there was a brightness in the air and on the grass and a joy in their hearts which assured them that he had been no dream, and anyway, there was the donkey in front of them. King Loon was the kindest-hearted of men, and on seeing his enemy in this regrettable condition, he forgot all his anger. Your Royal Highness, he said. I am most truly sorry that things have come to this extremity. Your Highness will bear witness that it was none of our doing, and of course we shall be delighted to priv uh, provide your Highness with shipping back to Tashben for the er, treatment, which Aslan has prescribed. You shall have ever comfort which your Highness's situation allows, the best of cattle boats, the freshest carrots and thistles, but a deafening bray from the donkey, and a well-aimed kick at one of the guards made it clear that these kindly offers were ungratefully received. And here, to get him out of the way, I'd better finish off the story of Rabidash. He, or it, was duly sent back by boat to Tashben and brought into the Temple of Tash at the Great Autumn Festival. And then he became a man again. But of course, four or five thousand people had seen the transfer transformation, and the affair could not possibly be hushed up. And after the old Tisrock's death, when Rabidash became Tisrock in his place, he turned out to be the most peaceable Tisrock Callerman had ever known. This was because, not daring to go more than ten miles from Tashban, he can never go on a war himself, and he didn't want his Tarkins to win fame in the wars at his expense, for that is the way Tis rocks get overthrown. But those reasons were selfish, it made things much more comfortable for all the smaller countries round Calerman. His own people never forgot that he had been a donkey. During his reign, and to his face, he was called Rabidash the Peacemaker, but after his death, and behind his him up in a good history of Callerman, try the local library, you will find him under that name. And to this day in Callermine schools, if you do anything unusually stupid, you are likely to be called a second rabidash. Meanwhile, 
at Anvard, everyone was very glad that he had been disposed of before the real fun began, which was a grand feast held that evening on the lawn before the castle, with dozens of lanterns to help the moonlight, and the wine flowed, and tales were told, and jokes were cracked, and then silence was made, and the king's poet, with two fiddlers, stepped out into the middle of the circle. Erebus and Kor prepared themselves to be bored, for the only poetry they knew was the calamine kind, and you know now what that was like. But at the very first scrape of the fiddles, a rocket seemed to go up inside their heads, and the poet sang the great old lay of Fair Olven and how he fought the giant pyre and turned him into stone, and that is the origins of Mount Pyre. It was a two-headed giant. And won the Lady Liln for his bride, and when it was over, they washed it, wished it was going to begin again. And though Bree couldn't sing, he told the story of the fight at Z Zolindre, and Lucy told again, they had all, except Erebus and Cor, heard it many times, but they all wanted it again, the tale of the wardrobe, and how she and King Edmund and Queen Susan and King Peter the High King had first come into Narnia. And presently, as was certain to happen sooner or later, King Loon said it was time for the young people to be in bed. And tomorrow, Cor, he said, shalt come over all the castle with me and see the estate and mark all its strength and weakness, for it will be thine to guard when I am gone. But Corin will be ki the king then, father, said Cor. Nay, lad, said King Loon, thou art my heir, the crown comes to thee. But I don't want it, said Cor. I'd far rather. Tis no question what thou wantest, Cor, nor I either. "'Tis in the course of the law. "'But if we're twins, we must be the same age. "'Nay,' said the king with a laugh, "'one must come first. "'Art Corin's elder by full twenty minutes, "'and is better, too, let's hope, "'though that's no great mastery.' "'And he looked at Corin with a twinkle in his eyes. "'But, father, couldn't you make whichever you like "'to be the next king?' No, the king's under the law, for it's the law that makes him a king. Hast no more power to start away from thy crown than any sentry from his post. Oh, dear, said Cor, I don't want to at all. And Cor and I am most dreadfully sorry. I never dreamed my turning up was going to chisel you out of your kingdom. Hooray, hooray, said Corin. I shan't have to be the king. I shan't have to be king. I'll always be a prince. Its princes have all the fun. And that's truer than thy brother knows, Cor, said King Lou. That, it was a, that is what it means to be a king, to be first in every desperate attack and last in every desperate retreat. And when there's hunger in the land, as must be now and then in bad years, to wear finer clothes and laugh louder over a scantier meal than any man in your land. When the two boys were going upstairs to bed, Cor asked Corin again if nothing could be done about it, and Corin said, If you say another word about it, I'll, I'll knock you down. It would be nice to end the story by saying that after that, the two brothers never disagreed about anything again, but I'm afraid it would not be true. In reality, they quarreled and fought just about as often as any other two boys would, and all their fights ended, if they didn't begin, with Cor getting knocked down. For, though, when they had both grown up and become swordsmen, Kor was the most dangerous man in battle, neither he nor anyone in the North Countries could ever equal Corin as a boxer. That was how he got his name of Corin Thunderfist, and how he performed his great exploit against the lapsed bear of Stormness, which was really a talking bear, had, but had gone back to wild bear habits. Corin climbed up to its lair on the Narnian side of Stormness one winter day when the snow was on the hills and boxed it without a timekeeper for thirty-three rounds, and at the end it couldn't see out of its eyes and became a reformed character. Erebus also had many quarrels, and I'm afraid even fights with Kor, but they always made it up again so that years later, when they were grown up, they were so used to quarreling and making it up again that they got married so as to go on doing it more conveniently. And after King's Loon, King Loon's death, they made a good king and queen of Arkenland, and Ram the Great, the most famous of all the kings of Arkenland, was their son. 
Bree and Hwyn lived happily to a great age in Narnia, and both got married, but not to one another, and there weren't many months in which one or both of them didn't come trotting over the pass to visit their friends at Edvard. And that is the end of The Horse and His Boy. I hope you've enjoyed it, and don't forget to check out the links to see if you can download for yourself the other stories of Narnia. The next one is Prince Caspian, but I'll let you check that out.